Chris needs a ring light. Chris has a ring light. He just goes blind if he turns it up too high. And you know, really, what problem which are we trying to solve here? People are trying to get a better look at me. I think not. <laughs> it's not a good idea. <laughs> Trust me when I say what I show on my terminal is far, far more interesting than looking at this mug. Chris, you look like one of those interviews on 60 Minutes where, you, where you're not supposed to show yourself. Yes. Yep. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Uh, WPO said hackers don't work in the light. So Chris is lighting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're going to the dark web, you got to be in the dark. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> that's why I knew there was a reason. Yeah, that's one of the gatekeeper things, yes. Uh, Come to the dark side, we have cookies. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today with Naomi. This is going to be her first webcast alone, so we're all excited for her. Yay. You guys, yes. She did partner with Lisa in a webcast earlier last year, How to Get Started with Rita. Today we're going to be looking at our new open source project, SB, that we released about a couple months ago. There's a common problem nowadays, especially with the uptick in the amount of remote workers uh, due to COVID especially. Remote workforces are hard to threat hunt. There's really no single point where you can put a network sensor. So let's say you have an organization and you generally place your sensors on the perimeter of your network. Well, with remote hosts, they're not on your network. So there's nowhere that you can centrally collect all of this data. So you might say, okay, well, let's go ahead and put a sensor in every employee's home. Well, then that means that you got to go ahead and buy a sensor for each individual employee. And that can get pretty expensive pretty quickly, not to mention a major privacy issue bet that most employees would not be very keen on their employer collecting their network traffic for their entire home network. And not to mention analysts probably don't want to be sifting through Xbox logs either. So how can we combat these issues? That's where SB comes in. It goes and collects network traffic on Windows hosts, regardless of whether or not the host is on-prem or remote. It runs a small agent in the background, which does require a one-time installation. And then the network traffic from all of the hosts that have the agent installed is collected onto a centralized server that you host. And then that traffic is eventually turned into Zeek logs that can then be analyzed however you wish. And the traffic can also optionally be sent to an Elasticsearch instance. So what is SB? It's a reference to the word eSpy. eSpy sounds a bit ominous, but it means to catch sight of. Since SB captures traffic on remote hosts, it gives you the chance to catch sight of threats that you might not have otherwise been able to. So that's where the name kind of comes from. It is an open source project on GitHub, and it combines Sysmon, WinLogBeat, and then ZeekLog output plus the Elasticsearch output. Quick overview of Sysmon. It is developed by Microsoft Sysinternals Group. It's free, but it doesn't ship with Windows. So that does mean that you're going to have to install it. It does run as a background process and permits you to collect event activity from the local system. And SB focuses on event ID 3s. Uh, event ID 3s are network events. It collects the TCP and UDP connections on a machine. It does have a process UID, and it gives you the source and destination IP address. Essentially, very basic information about a network connection plus the process that started it. If you want to view these events in Event Viewer, you can go to Applications and Service Logs, Microsoft, Windows, Sysmon. So how does this all tie in with SB? Let's say you have three employees who are working remotely. You have Bob on his home network. You've got Alice working at a Starbucks today and Sally's at the airport working on through a VPN. Each of these hosts have the SB agent installed and that agent will send data to your SB server. And then that data eventually gets output as Zeek 
con logs, which can then be ingested by Rita, or you can analyze them however else you, you'd like to. They are the standard Zeek format, so it's, it's not like they're any different from any other Zeek logs. And then you can also output it to Elasticsearch. And if you are an AC Hunter customer, it is integrated with it as of version 5.0. So from a dev perspective, you have Syswan feeding WinLog beat the ID event three items in the Elastic common schema format, which is JSON, and that gets sent to Redis. Redis works as a buffer for collecting the ECS data from all of the Windows hosts that are running the agent. And the reason why you need a buffer is I know three, three hosts doesn't seem like a lot, but once you start getting into 10, 30, 100, all of that network traffic gets pumped into SB. So if you're not throwing them into a buffer, it's eventually not going to be able to output the each individual packet information into your Zeek logs, which leads to data loss. So that's why we do use Redis as a buffer for that. And so the individual network events eventually are popped off of the buffer stack and transformed into the Zeek, into Zeek logs. And then it, it gets passed into Elasticsearch via an HTTPS POST request. So along with that idea, Redis will place each individual con event, well, event into a, a main con log in an ECS spool folder. And then hourly, those logs are rotated. So those logs can be found in opt Zeek logs. Those are grouped in folders by day. And then there's a con log each hour for all of that information. The con logs contain traffic from all of the hosts running the Windows agent. So it's not like you get a con log for each individual host running it. It will take all of the hosts and combine them as if it asks, as if it's like a, uh, a single, like virtual network sensor. So uh, you don't have to be flipping through a bunch of uh, different logs. And the logs contain a unique identifier for each host, as well as the host NetBIOS computer name. So here's an example of a SB generated Z log. We have, my computer here, uh, let's say, whoops, I didn't mean to click that. Then we have Bob Smith and Alice Jerry. So each individual host that is running the agent will have their own unique identifier. This identifier is generated by WinLog Beat itself. So in theory, if you did install when log beat again, the ID could change. But aside from that, the ID would never change. But what's cool is let's say you have, I'm here at home, right? So my, my PC, Naomi Goddard 9BF9, has an IP address of 10.211.55.16. But then Bob Smith at home also has the same IP address. Well, we're able to differentiate these two computers due to having the NetBIOS name inside of the logs. So no, you don't have to worry about the same IP address being across separate networks since common IP addresses are within the 10 or 192 range. So having those collisions is not an issue. The installation for SB is pretty straightforward. The you want to set up the SB server first before installing the agent on any of the hosts. The install script is in the root of the GitHub repo. To view the logs for SB itself, which is what collects everything and then spits it out, is uh, sb.shell logs fsb. And then you can use this to view the actual logs for the Redis server that resides within the SB script. Each remote host needs the SB agent installed. It is Windows only, so unfortunately, SB won't work for Linux or Mac OS users. The agent install script is in the agent folder in the repo. 
and you might have to modify your execution policy for the script to run. So there's a quick little excerpt in case you need that for reference. So how can we use SB with Rita? Any imported data sets will now have the network name of the source and destination of the connection. So each host is distinguishable across different networks, kind of what I was talking about uh, just a minute ago. For hosts that are not running the Windows agent, the source host name will be labeled as unknown private, since we don't know what it is, since we're not tallying that information. And then the destination will be labeled as public. And analysis on SB generated logs will only produce results for the beacon, strobes, and long connections module. Since the data that WinLogB passes over to SB is just basic packet information, it doesn't fully populate all of the fields for Zeek logs. So, unfortunately, that is a bit of a limitation, but at least we get basic C2 information. Analysis of hosts does keep each host unique. So if there are two hosts with the same IP address, they will be treated as separate hosts. So let's say Alice at Starbucks has an IP address of 10.55.200.10 and has beaconing behavior with an external IP address, but Carol at home has the same IP address as Alice. Carol's network traffic won't contribute to Alice's speaking analysis, so we don't have to worry about any kind of IP collision. Rita will separate the, the analysis for each unique agent to IP address relationship. But that also means that if one host has two, I, two different IP addresses, so let's say Alice was working at Starbucks that day, had an IP address of 10.55.200.10 and then went home and had a separate IP address of 192.168.1.515. The analysis will be done separately for each IP. So even though it's running on the same host, that network data will be analyzed differently since the there's a unique relationship for each host plus IP, not just the host itself. So looking at a SB generated imported data set, we can use the NN flag, also known as the network name flag on any read of show commands that use IP addresses. I believe the only, the only commands that it won't work for like DNS or user agent since there are no IPs used. So I'll go ahead and talk about these for a moment, but since this is small, I'm going to switch over to my Linux box. One hey, second. Naomi. Mm -hmm. Do you mind um, answering just a few questions that I've seen pop up? Yeah, sure. Um, so the first one is, for security purposes, is SB intended to run over an enterprise VPN network? meaning private IP to private IP slash host name, or does SB server need to be hosted on a public IP slash host name to be reached from any client connected to the internet? It does need to be publicly available since your hosts that you're analyzing are outside of your network. So if they're not able to connect to it, uh, SB won't be able to pass over the network logs to it. I hope that answers the question. Okay. I think it does. Okay. Um, the next one is, um, so it's a Windows to Windows setup. Can it monitor Linux logs? No, it cannot monitor Linux logs nor Mac OS logs. It can only work on Windows remote hosts. But SB itself, the server, runs on Ubuntu. Okay. And then last question, can SB be integrated into Splunk as well? At the moment, it doesn't export to Splunk, but since it is open source, you feel free to pass the data over to it. It is in the Elastic Comma Schema, so any fields that you need are easily referable in uh, Elastic's docs. 
and then you would just take those fields and just pass whichever ones are of interest to you over to Splunk. So it is possible, but that does require some developer effort. Okay. All right. And last question, that's a follow-up question. How is the log transfer secured if it's passing over the internet without a VPN? You can enable TLS, which is recommended, especially if your Redis server is running separately from SB itself. And I believe WinLogB runs over HTTPS. Aside from that, I'm not sure. Okay. That is correct. So yeah, if you're looking at WinLogB from Elastic, it does support the full TLS transfer, so it would be encrypted in transit. Awesome. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you, John. And uh, those were the only questions I had right now, so I'll let you get back to it. Okay, cool. So we were looking at the read output for any SB generated logs that are, have been imported. You could run, like I said, any of the standard Rita show commands that use any kind of IPs in them. So if you run this, it will go ahead and give you this output here. I just have it here, so it's a little bit easier to read. So here you have like your standard beaconing score. These are beacons, by the way, just to make sure that was clear. So we have Carol on oh, the source. The source of the connection is Carol talking to a public IP. These are all public because we don't know the NetBIOS name of the destination since they're not running the agent. So the only time that the destination would ever be anything else other than public is if it was A, either an unknown private IP, or B, that the source was connecting to another Windows host that was also running the agent. But aside from that, we can see that Carol has an IP of this. And then we also have Bob here, who is also running the agent. And he's got this IP. And then if we look here at Alice Late and Alice Early, these are two separate hosts. They both have the same IP address, but even though they have the same IP address, there is no collision with the data that's being analyzed. As you can see, this has Alice Late has their own beaconing analysis done separately from Alice Early. So any network traffic that's collected for Alice early will not contribute to anything related to Alice late. So that's not a concern. But essentially for any, for any SB, any Windows host running SB, you'll have its NetBIOS name as the source network name and then its destination network, which will almost always be public. That's essentially how those logs would look. If we go back to our slides. Uh, how would we leverage SB with AC Hunter? When SB is installed alongside AC Hunter, the logs created by SB are ingested along with the standard Zeek logs. So let's say you're running a network sensor and those usually get sent into a rolling data set. Anything that's imported by SB will also end up into your rolling data set. And the NetBIOS names for hosts running the SV agent will appear in several host name or network name fields. And that was introduced in version 5.0. And so I believe, yeah, the next few slides just have some screenshots of AC Hunter, but I'll go ahead and pull up a demo for that. So as you can see, we have our top scoring hosts here and each host has their host name. And of course, if any show up with unknown private, that just means that that host is not running SB. If we go to beacons and we hover over each individual IP, we'll be able to see what the NetBIOS name of that host is. And then we can also see it up here in the recon section. Oh, okay, there is. So we can see with strobes, we have the source host name and the destination host name of the connection. Same thing with long connections. And then if we go to 
deep dive when we search now we also get the netbios name so if we don't know it again it will just say public but if we do know it we'll have the name i believe there's one right up here and close there we go so then we'll also see the host name up here when we uh go into deep dive so it makes it easier to be able to see like if you have your normal z traffic that's running within your network all set up already and then you have your sb generated data also being imported it's easy to differentiate which ones are your internal since none of them would be running um sb inside of your network so those would just be unknown private and then any that are running externally you'd be able to see their net bios names and then be able to tackle any threats that you find from there so that's essentially an overview of sb if anyone has any questions i know that was a bit quick so feel free to barrage me with those some, and we are getting some more questions, so um, I'll start throwing out the ones we have now. And everyone, if you have any more questions, feel free to toss them out as we go along. So the first one is, uh, can SB buffer the data until the host reconnects to the network? Can, can you repeat that? Can SB buffer the data until the host reconnects to the network? Okay, so if, let's say, a host already passed data into Redis, unless it, it, it will just keep popping it off and turning those into, like, events inside of Zeek logs, and if, for some reason, that Windows host disconnects from SB for whatever reason, it will reconnect to it automatically. I'm not sure if that's what you meant. Okay. I'm not sure either. Maybe they will clarify. Don, if you want to clarify, if you're still with us. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense because the system isn't going to completely lose internet connectivity. It'd still be talking to hosts out on the internet. It would have to be, yeah, it might still be able to get to the internet, just not the server to be able to deliver the log entry. So Naomi, I think you, you grabbed that question, right? Okay. So we got one question that I'll take since we'll, we'll kind of do round robin. What about privacy issues? So one of the cool things about this, well, there's two things that are really cool from a privacy perspective. I just realized I don't have my camera on, so I apologize for that. Two quick things whenever we're looking at this from a privacy perspective. Number one, whenever you're looking at what is being generated by Sysmon Event ID 3, it's not going to tell you like somebody's going to this particular website, right? It's just gonna say, this is an IP address, this is a port, this is a protocol. And that's what you're going to get from it. Further, if so, thank you, Naomi, for putting up event ID three. So we're not getting a lot of very personal data, right? But if we go back even further, if you actually look at what is being generated once the Zeek log is created, once again, that's just straight con log data. So this is really cool if you're working someplace that has like European privacy directives or you're worried about GDPR, we're not capturing any of that data. We're still able to do analytics on it and look for evil on it as well. Robin asked, and I'll throw this up to the group, SB doesn't include DNS information. Is that correct? Yeah, it does not. That information isn't made available by WinLogB, so that's why we don't collect that information. And I do believe that Sysmon recently added in the ability to do DNS logging. So maybe we'll add that at some point in the future, but right now that is a brand new feature and we, we had our whole development cycle. So that might be something that we add depending on how interested the community is for this as a whole. Awesome. And here's a question that um, one of you might be able to answer. It might be better for you, John. In theory, how large can this scale? Can this be something used by large enterprises? Yeah, so if you're looking at this, um, it depends on how large your uh, your elk stack is going to be. The number of events per second that you're going to be getting off of a box aren't very much because if you actually look at Sysmon event ID three, you're not talking events per second. You're talking events per minute per host. So 
What I mean by that is whenever you open up a connection with an application going out to the internet, that is one log. It's not going to log every single SIN packet that's being sent. It's just basically going to be this, this uh, screenshot. And Naomi has up, says that this particular process opened up this connection to this particular IP address. So it really doesn't generate that much data at all. Now, if you have a backdoor that's beaconing and it's doing completely separate and distinct TCP IP sessions, then yeah, it's going to be a lot of logs, but that's going to be for a beacon more so than you would actually see, um, and then you would actually see around normal apps as well. And Robin just asked a question, I think I already answered for it. Anything else? Do we have any hardware spec recommendations for the SB server based on the expected amount of agents? At this particular point, I don't think we do. Do we, know, Naomi? I don't think that we've done any stress testing, but once again, it's really not that much data at all. No, biggest thing I would say at least, depending on the amount of agents that you have, just make sure that you have enough space uh, in your OpZeek logs folder, because that's going to become the largest. And then along with that, just enough RAM for Redis so that it can buffer yeah. everything because they all get stored in memory. So if you have a large amount of hosts trying to pass information into it, you don't have enough RAM, that's going to be the biggest um, throttle for it. Okay. Okay. Um, so Chris, I've got a question for you. Burnt asked, is Corelight aware of SB and that SB can be incorporated with less effort than maybe can be done directly into Splunk? <laughs> sorry, um, dude, I set you up. I set you up and I'm sorry. Yeah, you did. You did. But that's okay. I do it to you all the time. But, so we have stayed in sync with them, sort of. It's been a little bit asynchronous because uh, so Corelight about a year ago came out with this really cool thing called Zeek Agent. And we looked at Zeek Agent and we got really excited because it's basically like Zeek for endpoints, which was kind of nice. And they've done a little bit of dev work on the Linux side. They did a little bit of dev work on the Mac side. And there was a big announcement about, yeah, we're going to support this. There's going to be a Windows version and all this other stuff. And we looked at that and we said, wow, guys, this is awesome. And, you know, hey, we're even like willing to, to donate dev time to help get this over the line. You can do so many cool things with this. And we kind of got crickets back. So, you know, we did kind of talk about, look, we really want to go down this road. And if you guys aren't going to do it, we're going to do it. So those conversations have been had. How much it's really stuck on the core light side, I'm honestly not sure. Well, and this gets into how everything shifted. Uh, Naomi, you mentioned this at the very beginning of this webcast. You, you talked about how COVID changed everything. And when we were looking at the trajectory for Rita and AC Hunter, we were looking at you know maybe a couple of years before we started collecting data on the endpoint, doing beaconing analysis on the endpoint. COVID completely changed that overnight because now everybody is working from home and people want that type of beaconing detection for all the remote. And no one users. wants to go back. Oh my God, I can't imagine having to wear pants every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that would suck. I don't know how people, I don't know how you people deal with that. But then kind of the thought process through this, just give people a little bit of background information. Chris, we looked at uh, NetSH logging um yes. that was that was a nightmare brutal um, <laughs> yes it was evil and i remember yes. chris and i were talking there has to be some way that microsoft is actually tracking these types of metrics in a way that we can actually ingest it and then we started talking about sysmon integration and i was talking to naomi about it like i don't know a, a number of months ago and i think naomi had a proof of concept up and running in just under like, a week yeah. Yeah, yeah, like so a weekend. It was like, <laughs> Chris and I are like, how do we make this work? And Naomi's like, does this do it? And we're like, yes, <laughs> do that thing, go. So it really solved a lot of our problems um, in dealing with it. And Sysmon is well known. That is another thing I think is absolutely critical is you get into this whole, um, you get into this whole not another agent, right? So somebody was talking about MDR and NDR and um, you know all of these different EDR products that are out there. And I'm like, well, yeah, you could get this data from Silence or Endgame or whatever. You can, but they're not gonna do beaconing data. They're not gonna integrate with Elk. They're not gonna do yeah. a lot of things. And more importantly, do you want another agent running on your system? With SB, it's Sysmon. 
And it's not well, like and, we're, and as we're and as we and as we learn back in December, yet another vendor with infrastructure yeah. access. <laughs> yep. Oh my God. And this yes. helps to limit that. They're not here right now, but I was just mentioning Corelight has joined our Threat Hunter community server. Um, so if people do have questions around Zeek or other things um, Corelight related, um, if you go to the bottom of the server, you'll see a Corelight section with a Corelight general channel. Um, and then they also should be able to respond in the Zeek channel as well. Um, and you can even at them with the Corelight role. So, yeah, and, and I want to be clear, I'm not smack talking Corelight. They, they brought us Zeek. Oh my God, yeah. that's like Nirvana. I mean, my, my life would be hell without Zeke. So oh, yeah. I, I don't want that taken the wrong way, but you know, different companies prioritize different things. And you know, I think we just kind of broke differently when it came to this type of stuff, so. Yeah, and I think that this is an elegant solution, right? For converting that Sysmon data into Zeek data. I just think, I just think it works. So that what's cool about this is if you're a Corelight customer, because it's Zeek format, you can actually integrate this into the entire Corelight ecosystem as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and oh, by the way, it's open source, it's free. You're not gonna pay, you know, insane dollars per endpoint that you wanna go through and collect this type of information from, so. Absolutely. So. And John, we've gotten a request for you to get a set of pink ear headphones like me and Naomi so that you can match. <laughs> you, you order them. It's an approved, it's an approved uh, purchase. Just go ahead and say accounting. John approved it and have it sent to the Spearfish office. And I will wear the pink kitty headphones. I, I will do oh, it. Oh God, that is a dream come true. <laughs> now we have to make that happen. Okay, so so I, I've seen this question come up a couple of times. I don't exactly know the answer, but I know we've talked about it, which is any interest in supporting Mac and Linux? I know, yes, but Bill, maybe you could speak to that a little bit because I know you and I have had those conversations. Yeah, the, the information is there. It can get pulled out in a couple of ways, either with the audit log subsystem or with um, SysTrace. But the, uh, the, the details of it, uh, it's easy to make a proof of concept <laughs> and actually merging that into the finished product is going to take some developer time. So uh, we, we have to go and schedule some time to make that happen on the Linux side. And I suspect there's something similar on Mac OS, although I haven't looked into that. Well, yeah, and the so, other thing, so, oh, oh, go for it, dude. I was just going to say, uh, the other thing is this company is, you know, we're a self-funded company. And one of the things that Chris uh, always preaches to us is before we spend a lot of money developing on something, let's make sure that there's a there there. So if you're looking right. at Linux specifically, a lot of the, our customers that are running Linux, they're running it on servers, which are in server farms, which usually are on good switches, which means we can get beaconing data off of a spam port or a mirrored port on that switch. When you're talking about Mac, yes, there's lots of people using Mac, but from a percentage perspective, and corporate in the corporate environment, not nearly as much as Windows. So we had to start somewhere, and this is where we started. Yep. Now, as far as support for it goes, I found that like if I buy Bill an Italian dinner, he usually has a solution by 2 a.m. You know, it's a hacky Python script that the devs would have to hold their nose and you know go through an edit to make it proper. But he's really good at pulling in proof concepts. So they only have to hold their nose because you bought me an Italian dinner with garlic in it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Naomi, I got a question from you from Green Geek. Um, it said, "What was the reason for using Redis over Logstash to collect the logs? Could Logstash be used to further filter and enrich enrich the data before being placed in Elastic?" So essentially, short answer is using Logstash would have been really gross. It takes up. Don't hold back, Naomi. How do you really feel? Let it go. Talk Let it go. This. Roll with Share it. your feelings. If, if we were only... your things very apt at this point, so let's <laughs> go with it. If we were only exporting the data over to Elasticsearch, it would have been probably feasible since you're just passing the data into Logstash and it just gets fed into Elasticsearch. But because we wanted to be able to make the data um, available in Zeek logs, we have to have some kind of program that takes all of that ECS data and turns it into Zeek logs. And trying to take the, uh, like if you piped it into Logstash and then piped it out of Logstash, it just would have taken too many resources to have anything that's relatively memory efficient 
and it just also would have been pretty just gross to write in general. So that's why. Yeah, and Redis just gave us that flexibility that we could fork it and send it to Elastic and also format it and drop it into a file that Rita could pick up, right? Yeah, I mean, we, there's a, you yeah. could essentially export it to as many different types of things you wanted to with Redis. So it just kind of gives us a lot more flexibility than Logstash. Okay. Yep, so big beaker as well, which is kind of nice. I did see someone <laughs> I did see someone that asked a question. I know Naomi and the other developers that are watching the webcast are gonna be like, oh God. Uh they said, couldn't you just conceivably merge SB and Beaker together into one thing? I think the answer to that is yeah, we could, but we're so tired. And there's only so many things that we can do. You know? <laughs> Well, I think some of it is also scale and some of it is also uh, Beaker we've been working on for a while. We know that's pretty solid. This is brand new code. You know, consider it alpha. So it, it may work really well. It may give you some trouble. And we want to try and keep things stable. Could we merge them together later down the road? Ab absolutely. If, if the moon is in Virgo and everything lines up appropriately, but we wanted to take shortest path to get it off the ground and keep things segregated so that people can run what they know is going to be stable and hey you know here's something new and fun to play with yeah and and i think that that also kind of shows us shows people like if you're looking at the open source projects that we're releasing like we don't take this stuff and say this is only for our commercial product and pay us lots of money we're like here's something cool for the community i mean you go to active countermeasures you look at our free tools there's a lot of sucking at capitalism going on for active <laughs> There is far more free tools than commercial ones. Yes. <laughs> one, one commercial tool. But I also fundamentally believe, and you know, let's talk about Corelight for a second. Whenever you're looking at working with a firm or a company, right, and they have this amazing product and they're like, trust us, this product works. And you're like, well, can I try it? And they're like, it, only in our controlled environment. And they don't really have a lot of free things. They don't have a lot of kind of you know, proof that they have skill sets in this particular area, I get nervous, right? So if you're looking at companies like Corelight, they gave us Zeke. They're like, here's the heart of everything that we do for free. I mean, that's cool, right? You look yeah. at Canary and Thinkist, uh, Haroon does the exact same thing. You can rebuild a lot of Canary's infrastructure with all the stuff that they release open source. So we have this definite soft spot in our hearts for trying to give these things to the community to try to make the overall community better. And uh, that's ultimately what we're doing with SB as well. Yes, this can be incorporated into AC Hunter. Yes, it's a lot easier to hunt with AC Hunter. But at the end of the day, if you have a problem, you want connection monitoring on remote users and you want it to be able to scale and work really well and integrate with your ELK environment, SB is your tool. And there's no other tools that are actually doing anything like this that gives you beaconing and connection data that's useful off the endpoint, especially in the COVID era. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm seeing two more questions that I want to toss out to you guys. So I'm assuming besides the SB server and the client's install, individual clients would need Sysmon installed previously. Correct. I think that SB installs Sysmon, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So, Wonderful. yeah. And really, whenever you're talking about SB, it's not another agent. We're really connecting, you know, WinLogB and Sysmon together, configuring it and setting it all up for you in one nice little PowerShell script. All right. And then, um, is it even possible to catch the public IP address if an SB host is behind a router and getting its IP via? DHCP? So yeah, it, that is, so it's all gonna be captured. So if you're looking at the way DHCP actually works, that gives your endpoint system, its IP address, its gateway, its network mask, its DNS settings. Whenever you're looking at your sysmon logs, even if you're behind that firewall, you're gonna see the source IP address, which is RFC 1918, and you're going to see the external IP address. It's not going to be the IP address of the gateway but it's going to be the IP address of the ultimate server that it's connecting to online. So yeah, you're still gonna be able to see that endpoint. Well, I, I think what they're looking for, John, is the uh, legal IP address that the source is using. And yeah, you, you, so you can't get that out of Sysmon data. Oh, oh, you mean the because external? As far as, yeah, because as far as yeah. the source, source system is concerned, that private address is at its, its address. 
But, you know, if you hit like the website, you know, what's my IP address? It's real easy to set up a query where when, when a system connects, you just feed back over an HTTPS session, hey, you just connected from this legal IP, and now we'd be able to pull that into SP. This is something we actually talked about, but it was kind of looked at as a nice to have for later because one of the things you run into a lot is people run NAP. So you can very easily end up with, you know, 250, 100 different IPs, uh, source IPs, that all look like they're the same legal IP address because they're all getting natted to the same address. And does that really help or mean anything? So that was a feature that we kind of looked at that said, you yeah, know, we're going to focus on other things instead for right now. So a couple more questions. Somebody said, would SB be effective with Windows subsystem for Linux? And I'm assuming it's Windows subsystem for Linux 2 on hosts. So if you look at what Windows subsystem for Linux is now on Windows, it is a complete virtualized Linux kernel with a full virtualized TCP IP stack. So it's the equivalent of running a virtual machine on your Windows computer system. So no, you would not get uh, the connection logs with uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. And then Green Geek asked, how does the agent differ from Sysmon for win log beats? It literally is that. It's literally Sysmon <laughs> yep. and win log beats with some configurations automatically handled for you in the PowerShell script to kick that data out to the Redis server, load it into Elk, and then drop it into a file for Rita to pick it up on. Awesome. And I'm not sure if you've seen Robin's question yet. Um, when Beaker is already installed, will installing SB override the current um, WinLog beat configuration? Not 100% on that, but I'm going to say yes. Yeah, that okay. might be something that we need our PowerShell script to look into and say, oh, Beaker's here. Okay. Yeah. And then, then, it would just be, then it would just be a modification to the configuration. So with WinLogB, you can actually send different logs to multiple different IP addresses. So yeah, that would probably just be a modification to that script as well. Okay, yeah, you can just depend. Hey, so uh, JC Denton asked the question, is there an idea to combine an analysis for the same client, even if the client switches IP addresses because it works from different locations? The target system for a beacon should be the same after all, external legal IPs, da da da. So that is harder than it sounds. In other words, which, you know, the, the concept sounds good, right? Hey, I am at a coffee shop and then I'm going to go back home and work. And if I've, my system's compromised and it's beaconing, then we, you should be able to track that those beacons are the same, even though I was at a coffee shop and now I'm at my home. The problem is we need something to anchor onto, right? And it can't be the host name because so many systems have that default Windows host name to it. So we look at a combination of the source IP that's been assigned to it, as well as that host name, to be able to differentiate between two different systems that both have the same host name assigned to it, as well as two different systems that have the same source IP address. Because again, you can have, you know, most people's home networks is 192.168.0 or .1. something. So you need to be able to distinguish between those. Is there a way to do it? Maybe. We haven't come up with one yet. But if you've got ideas, hey, we'd love to chat more about this. Awesome. Here we go. We had someone ask about pricing. They're like, so with AC Hunter, you're looking at about $50,000 for 20,000 20, endpoints? No, once again, we fuck at this. Like, no, it's, it's less than 9000 by like the $5 bill. So, and that's a site license, right? So it's not like... You know, well, what if we have 20 sites? It's less than 9,000. What if we got 100 sites? It's less than 9,000. Yeah. What if but I want to keep like data a for a year? Number? Yeah. <laughs> it's less than 9,000. Like, it's just, so yeah, it's pretty. Oh, strange. no, I, I've got 100 gig connections to the internet. That must make it cost me more. No, it's. That, that would cost more because then we're going to have to work on them, work with them to develop a custom system that can handle a 100 gig link. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But we've, we've found uh, out actually, that, you know, actually, we've John, if you go in and just filter out the stuff you don't care about, like NetBio broadcast and stuff like oh, that, yeah, yeah that, that pulls it right down. So you need to do a little bit of BP filtering, but yeah, you can get up into that range. You can do that, but it's, your price isn't the hardware, or sorry, your price isn't the software at that point. It's the yes, hardware. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's yeah, you'll, probably, your you'll probably spend as much on your network card as you will on our software. Yes. Yeah, probably more, actually. 
Uh, and like John mentioned earlier, if you're interested in learning more about AC Hunter, our commercial tool, uh, you can type demo either into the GoToWebinar chat or the Discord chat, and we'll reach out to you to schedule a personal demo, um, either with John or with Chris. And, and I want to be sensitive here, Naomi. John and I just kind of jumped in and started talking. Did you have more slides to go through? No, that was. Or are all. you all set? Oh, okay, awesome. cool. Yes. <laughs> okay. By the way, I, I don't. I, I had this fear that I was going to ask that question, and you were going to come back and say, "Yeah, I've only got twenty slides left." <laughs> and I don't think we can stress enough, like how how thankful we are for Naomi and what she's actually done, and and oh. a lot of the people on the team as well, because this was a huge stress for Chris and I, and she basically came up with proof of concept, ran with it, and uh, it's been fantastic. So just great job, Naomi. Uh, we, uh, John, I don't know what it is, but we seem to get really lucky with folks. So Hannah, our, our, our newest uh, intern, basically like built almost the entire CTF. <laughs> I mean, yeah. other folks helped, but an intern ran point on that, and we're going to be announcing that CTF in probably another week or so. Uh, that that yeah. just blows me away. So H Hannah has just turned out to be freaking awesome. I don't know how we keep getting so lucky. I, I just there's lots of, lots of people out there that are are just they just kick ass. So yeah, I just yeah. wanted You're to very toss in there team. though. That, What's that, uh, I just wanted to toss in that uh, SB wouldn't have been possible without the rest of our dev team. I don't want to take the credit for it because I did only a, a smaller portion of it, but the whole yeah. design is part of another developer's genius. <laughs> well, come on, you could say who they are. Logan. Logan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Logan. That's another great person. Yeah, Logan has been awesome. Yep. Who will be full time soon? Yay. Yes. Which that couldn't happen fast enough. I swear. So. All right. Uh, any final questions, uh, Shelby? Um, I'm not seeing anything else coming up. So I think we've pretty much handled all the questions. Um, there is one thing that I do want to talk about real quick before we let everybody go. Um, and that's in case anyone isn't aware, um, Active Countermeasures runs what used to be a four hour uh, free threat hunt training. But recently after the last session we did, we've decided to make it a six hour training instead. Um, yeah, at least way... for this next one on the weekend. Yep. Yes. Yeah, because that leaves a lot more time for uh, the labs and stuff like that. So if anybody is interested in taking the next session, I'm going to share the link in both GoToWebinar and Discord right now. The next session is going to be the 20th of this month, which is a Saturday. And the cool part about taking the training live, um, besides the fact that this one's going to be six hours instead of four, is that when you take the training live, you do get that um, certificate of attendance to go along with it as well. Yeah. Um, and you get to ask Chris questions personally. Um, no, of... no, I take no questions. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Chris talks to no one. Yes, uh, exactly. It will be an entire webcast without me talking. Yeah. <laughs> Or if he but, does, he sure isn't going to be responding to anybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but, that just in, that just instigates people. So yes, yes, and um, Atomic Django suggested to download the VM now. Chris, I'm not sure if you plan on making any updates to the VM before the next trading, but we definitely do recommend downloading the VM before the start of the class. Yeah, actually, I see one more question I want to handle. Which awesome. is, uh, folks are talking about, let's see, Jared Bloomberg was asking about digital certificates and how one of the things you could do is you could go to the, the server and you could install, install a, a certificate and then have clients trusted and that, you know, that way they know they have a secure connection. The question was, should you do the same thing on the client side? And the answer for me is it's probably a good idea. If you want to authenticate that this data actually came from the host that it claims to be, one of the easiest ways to go through and do that is to just use a, you know, use a, a digital certificate on both sides of the connection. So that would be a good way to go through and authenticate this and do it in a seamless fashion so that you know, the user doesn't like to have to type in a password once or anything like that. Keep things nice and seamless. Naomi, you're awesome. Thank you for this. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you at a webcast soon. 
Yes, yes, this was an awesome presentation, Naomi. Thank you again for uh, your first solo webcast, so. Yeah, I don't know why John keeps saying bad things about you. You seem really cool. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> exposed. <laughs> I, I agree with you guys. Off. Thanks, Naomi. That was really, really cool. Yes. <laughs> All right. Later, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, folks. Enjoy the rest of your day.